the time period in question in this charge is a time period for which Harmony Montgomery was completely unaccounted for. This charge begins when Harmony disappeared. Whatever is suggested or alluded to by the state is not before the court. It's not an allegation that is facing Miss Montgomery. What is up, it's Dick and Mel. Welcome back to the channel and thank you for stopping by. We're gonna be talking about Harmony Montgomery, the updates. If you haven't seen the original video that I made on this, go and check it out because it's highly detailed, everything you need to know. But Harmony is the seven-year-old girl that has been reportedly missing for two years years from new hampshire and there's been a lot of back and forth between biological mother the father and the stepmother but biological father is arrested adam and so is kayla montgomery the stepmother and so there's new timelines out there's a more narrow time frame which we're going to talk about now and then there was also a trial preliminary hearing slash bail hearing arraignment hearing for kayla montgomery with regards to these fraud charges which say that Kayla was collecting food stamps for Harmony between December 2019 and June 2021 which she has not been seen since and with this new timeline it puts that into perspective straight to the source Manchester New Hampshire police and they say here the investigation to date has narrowed the window of Harmony's disappearance to approximately November 28th through December 10, 2019, and this is because police learned about Adam and Kayla Montgomery that together with two common children and Adam's daughter Harmony were evicted from this address, 77 Guilford Street in Manchester on November 27, 2019. Multiple individuals have reported seeing Harmony with Adam and Kayla in the following days. However, by approximately December 6 through December 10, 2019, Adam and Kayla apparently had only their two common children and Harmony was no longer with them. Police have narrowed down the time and they believe that between November 28th and December 10th, 2019, that this is the time frame where Harmony disappeared. Also, witnesses have reported that during that time, Adam, Kayla, and the children were homeless and living out of multiple cars, possibly in the north end of Manchester. One of the cars was a silver 2010 Chrysler Sebring and the other was a dark blue 2006 Audi S4. They attached stock photos of the vehicles, which I put here for you. And also they say that those are just stock. So it's just an example for people to know what the cars look like, but that the actual conditions of the cars in 2019 were way worse. So they're asking for tips from people that have either spoken to Adam, Kayla during that time or have seen those vehicles during that time. I think that's a great and amazing that they were able to narrow it down to that time it's going to be super important i also wanted to share with you this timeline which is this is credit to boston 25 there was a reporter that posted this and just to give you guys an idea or a little refresher around that time frame of 2019 the end of the year april was the last time that crystal the biological mother saw harmony through facetime july 2019 this is where the great uncle of harmony reports seeing harmony with a black eye and that supposedly adam the father did it and there's a whole backstory between that we covered that previously then october 2019 harmony is last seen by police during a call for service to a manchester home which i'm assuming it's the guilford address uh 77 guilford address in manchester thanksgiving 2019 which is right before they get evicted adam claims because this was from a 12 31 2021 interview from uh the court affidavit adam claims the father that crystal the biological mother comes to the home in manchester and gets harmony and this is where the timeline is now narrowed to because on the 27th they get evicted and so the time frame is between 28th and december 10 and so here November or December 2019, Adam's wife, Kayla Montgomery, last sees Harmony before Adam drives her to Crystal's home. And so hopefully that kind of, you know, for anybody that needed a refresher, I needed it myself, to be honest. It kind of clears up a little bit of like the weird wishy-washiness that's going on in this time frame of 2019. And now them specifically looking at like they didn't see Harmony with them any longer between December 6th and December 10th. But she was like they got evicted the 27th. So something happened after that, like between the 28th and the 10th. And especially, 
you know, after the fact that they don't see her any longer. So we're going to check out this video. This is the arraignment slash bail hearing for Kayla. And by the way, another reason to check out the original video that I did, we covered the father Adam's long, incredibly long history, criminal history. Like it's crazy that he was still out and about. Not only that, that he got custody of Harmony. All right. So uh, we're here both for an arraignment and a bail hearing this morning. So let me just ask you first, Attorney Garrity, have you reviewed the new complaints with Ms. Montgomery? I have, Your Honor. Uh, and uh, have you explained to her the maximum penalties for each charge? I got you wrong. And does she wish to enter pleas on those charges? Uh, not guilty, Your Honor. All right. The court will enter pleas of not guilty uh, on those charges. Will you file a waiver of arraignment? I will, Your Honor. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Montgomery, you've gone over the new charges that have been filed with Attorney Garrity? Yes. And um, has he explained to you the maximum penalties for each? Yes. And you wish to enter pleas of not guilty on each charge? All right. Uh, we're going to now turn to the issue of bail. So I'm going to hear from the state first, and then I will hear from you and your counsel. You can be seated. Attorney O'Neill. Thank you. The state is requesting that bail stand as ordered at the initial bail hearing. Um, first, let me provide a little bit of background about why we are here. So when we brought the initial welfare fraud charge against the defendant, uh, that was based on documentation that we had received, well, the Manchester Police Department and the state had received from DHHS and a review of that documentation. After bringing that charge, we learned of additional documents that we did not have from DHHS. Um, that caused us a little bit of concern. So we reached out, or I personally reached out to Attorney Garrity on uh, a Friday afternoon, which is when we learned of this, and basically told him that we've been informed there may be some issues with the charging, that it could even potentially reduce the charge to a class B felony. And that was the impetus, I would assume, for the defendant's motion for a bail here. That was on a Friday afternoon. DHHS spent the weekend gathering documents to give to us, and on Monday sat down with us to go through things. And what we discovered on Monday was that, while the initial charge may not have been the best charge to bring, that there was still a Class A felony theft charge here due to the amount of benefits um, stolen on behalf of Harmony by the defendant over that time period. Uh, so that was basically the replacement Class A felony. But in addition to that, realized that we could now point, based on this new documentation, to specific instances where the defendant had submitted Harmony on applications or other statements to DHHS. So they dropped the original charges. The original charges was earlier this month, Kayla Montgomery was charged with suspicion of obtaining $1,500 in food stamps from December 2019 to June 2021, the time frame. Uh, for harmony montgomery even though the girl was now living with kayla the new charges or what it was updated to one count of felony theft by deception and two counts of welfare fraud with the intent of continuing that fraud and continuing that theft uh, we identified eight specific instances of that that we could point to that was why in the objection we said that there would be the class a felony plus eight misdemeanors however in preparing the misdemeanors for filing we learned that six of those instances fell outside of the one year statute of limitations, which is why we only brought the two that we did. Uh, but those eight separate instances are detailed in the affidavit filed in support of the theft charge and the misdemeanor welfare fraud charge. So that's sort of the background for the court's benefit of why we're here with these uh, replacement charges. The bail argument is basically that there's no basis to change the bail. Um, everything in the state's original bail argument continues to still hold true. And if anything, it has only gotten worse in terms of the defendant's status as a flight risk. She was originally facing one class A felony charge. Now she's facing the class A felony charge and the two misdemeanors. Each of those misdemeanors potentially adding an additional year to the maximum sentence that the defendant could face uh, at the end of this. Um, another argument, that uh, the state made at the initial bail hearing was the issue of the defendant's shelter uh, and that she might potentially lose her ability to stay at fit because of this charge. Part of the defendant's current bail order is that if she's released, she is to live with her mother on Dubuque Street. I'm not sure if that's a possibility at this point because of the custody situation with the children and the fact that the defendant's mother has custody of the children at that address. 
I'm not sure if both the defendant and the children can be together at that same address. What would be the basis for them not being together? Uh, just because custody has been temporarily given to the defendant's mother, is my understanding. But there's no 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 contact provision or. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure on that, Your Honor. I've just been uh, I've been told there might be a potential situation where they couldn't both be the children and the defendant both be in the same place. Okay, have you checked on those custody orders? Uh, not not now. No. And the thing that's happening here, I believe, is because the timeline. You know, I mean, I, I, I guess there's nothing. The timeline kind of, there's nothing factual or like like evidence that we know of. I guess that she had something to do with Harmony, but they were all together. Looking at the time frame now that we got that context, they were all together. So, in my opinion, it seems like she maybe knew something. You know, and so. Even though I guess they can't use that as a, since there's, I don't know, maybe somebody can comment down their thoughts, but I'm guessing that's the reasoning behind is like, maybe she shouldn't be there with the kids. So as far as you're aware, there isn't an order in any sort of court order or DCYF order that precludes her from being there. As being far as I'm aware, there's no. There is not. As far as I'm aware, there is no. And <clears throat> At our previous hearing, you indicated that she had some uh, a limited prior criminal history. Were there any failures to appear uh, in those cases? Not that I'm aware. Right. And at our last hearing, I mean, there is a motion to reconsider, so I am considering all of the information. Uh, you agreed with the court that typically on these kinds of charges, an uh, individual wouldn't uh, necessarily have a cash bail. And, which has now resulted really in preventive detention, which is, I think, not what the court, not what the state has asked for. Um, is there anything you want to add uh, on that point? Uh, so there is. Um, this continues to be and can, continues to become even more of an unusual case. I, hear, I believe Your Honor, the last year I characterized it as an unusual request, and my answer was that it was an unusual case. It continues to be an unusual case. For the past four weeks, the Manchester Police Department, the FBI, and the U.S. Marshals have been working tirelessly and around the clock to find Herman Montgomery. The time period in question in this charge is a time period for which Harmony Montgomery was completely unaccounted for. This charge begins when Harmony disappeared, and that's the reason for this charge, because she wasn't with the defendant, and the defendant continued to receive benefits on her behalf and continue to make these affirmative representations that Harmony was still part of the household. One of the things that the court can consider, and this was the state's argument at the last hearing, uh, if the court is going to impose a financial condition that will result in the pretrial detention of the defendant, which is the situation we're in, um, the court can do that if the nature of the allegations presents a substantial risk that the defendant will not appear and that no reasonable alternative will assure her appearance. So this is a case where the nature of the allegations weigh extremely strongly in favor of the defendant being flight risk because of where the case is going, because of where the investigation is going. This isn't a white lie. This isn't a simple lie. This is an approximately 18 months long lie to get welfare benefits for a child who has disappeared despite a month of around the clock efforts of three strong law enforcement agencies to locate her, she still has not appeared. I suggest that that makes this defendant a strong flight risk. She knows what law enforcement is closing in on them. Maybe now it looks like an innocuous theft charge, welfare fraud charges, but she knows what we are going to learn to investigation. Mm. But you're not giving me any facts related to that. I mean, that's like what I was just saying. Law enforcement spoke with Ms. Montgomery uh, prior to her being arrested. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, and how long prior to that did they speak to her? Uh, roughly a week, approximately. So is that when she first became aware that this investigation was going on? I would assume so. 
And according to the affidavit, what she told police at that time was that her husband, Adam Montgomery, had taken Harmony to live with her mother the day after Thanksgiving in 2019. We know that that's not true. And without getting into the full details of the investigation, uh, Harmony's mother has been extremely cooperative. Everything we just talked about. She has been thoroughly investigated. Uh, individuals in her life have been thoroughly investigated. There's no evidence that Harmony was with her, no, no credible evidence that Harmony was with her after Thanksgiving of 2019 or, or long before that. Um, in addition, that's, that's where I'll stop, Judge. I'm trying to balance carefully being candid with the court while still protecting the ongoing investigation of the count into this missing child. I understand that. I, I guess to the extent that you're suggesting, however, that she be held because she knows where the child is. Is there some is there some evidence that the state can share with the court as to why you think you know what essentially what you're saying is that, that her report about what she what she, Ms. Montgomery, knew is inaccurate. There there is at least one individual who has told Manchester Police Department that he saw Harmony living with Adam and Kayla after that date when Kayla says that Harmony was taken back for about is there anything else you'd like to add? No, at this time. Okay, thank you. You ready? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, I, I would ask the court, and it seems like the court is uh, doing so, focus on the language of the statute that speaks about the nature of the allegations. The allegations before the court are a Class A felony theft and two misdemeanor counts of welfare fraud. Whatever is suggested or alluded to by the state is not before the court. It's not an allegation that is facing Ms. Montgomery. So the nature of the allegations are the theft and the wealth of fraud. Those typically call for PR bail. Uh, none of those charges pose a substantial risk that the person will not appear. As I'm sure the court knows, people charged in this court with much more serious offenses get PR bail. In fact, I, I, I know last week, I believe, an individual charged with uh, Class A felony, uh, first degree assault, stabbing an individual appeared before Judge Delger and was released on PR bail. That, that type of offense, the nature of that allegation would pose a substantial risk of flight potentially, not a theft or welfare fraud. Uh, and in particular with Ms. Montgomery, uh, her criminal history uh, is relatively minor and involves um, mostly misdemeanors. There are no um, failures to appear that I can find on her record. And, and in fact, her most recent offense that took place in uh, Merrimack District Court, she was arrested by the Bedford PD in May of 2015, appeared and resolved that case in September of 2015. Um, and there's no indication she was held on bail, so she was arrested in May of 2015, appeared as required, September, resolved it. Uh, that case involved uh, a disposition of a LADAC and restitution. She did the LADAC, she paid restitution, and she showed up the following year as she was required to, because she had a deferred sentence. She showed up in September of 2016 and showed the court cause to close the case. And the record shows that that's what took place. And I think that uh, that case shows that she will show up for future court appearances, that she will comply with court orders that uh, this court issues. Um, her ties are also to the Manchester area. She has three small children. They're four years old, two years old, one year old. Run, right, right now, they're residing with her mother on Dubuque Street. Uh, there, I could tell the court I spoke with Ms. Montgomery's DCYF attorney. There is no no contact with, between Ms. Montgomery and the children. However, uh, her attorney indicates that DCYF may take certain steps uh, with with the children if Ms. Montgomery goes back to live with her mother. Um, she knew uh, that the police were uh, interested in this case. They started to interview her shortly after Christmas of 2021. They spoke 
spoke with her on three or four occasions. Uh, they were showing up at uh, the Families in Transition uh, program that she was residing at with her children on almost a daily basis. And she had about a week and a half, of, if my math is correct, week and a half time to take off if she, so, uh, if she wanted to. She didn't have the means to do so. Uh, she had her children with her. Her family is from Manchester. She grew up in Manchester. She's lived here since about uh, nine years old, went to school in Manchester. All of her ties are to this community. Uh, there's no indication whatsoever that she's a flight risk. Um, but she does have an issue that she knows has to be dealt with. So I tell the court, uh, I've had communication with uh, Cynthia Day program uh, down in Nashua. Uh, they're uh, uh, going to evaluate Ms. Montgomery for intake into Cynthia Day. That program would address many of the needs that Ms. Montgomery has um, and also allow her children to be with her uh, because that's a family type of environment. Uh, so what we're asking uh, the court to do is to set bail a PR bail upon her entry into the Cynthia Day program or a similar type program. Do you have a reason to believe that she would be eligible for Cynthia Day? Uh, I, I can tell the court I spoke with the program uh, one of the one of the uh, directors there, um, I spoke to them about whether or not if she was released on bail, could she go into the program? Uh, she indicated it would be a better situation if she was sent directly from Valley Street down to the program. So Ms. Montgomery is asking the court and understanding the situation with Cynthia Day and what uh, what they view is the the optimal intake position. She's asking the court to set PR bail upon her entry into the program. And it appears that she meets the criteria for entry into the program. But she would need, that would require her to have her children with her, right? Uh, no, it does not. It does not. So the children would stay with the mother. They could visit with her as Cynthia Day. Cynthia Day uh, tells me that they have a limit of two children in terms of residing overnight, but all three could visit with her at the program. And Cynthia Day, so they're, they're currently, the state has current, currently asked that were she to be released, that she check in with the Manchester Police Department daily. You could do that by telephone. She doesn't have a, a car, so she wouldn't be able to drive from Nashua up to Manchester. And I'm, I'm not sure um, of the location of Cynthia Day with respect to the National Police Department in terms of checking in with them as a, as a condition of bail. She could do that by telephone or by Zoom, if that's what the court calls for. And she could sign a release that Cynthia Day would be required to immediately notify the state where she to leave the she program? Would. She would, Your Honor. Um, and she has, she has Otherwise, no objection to any of the conditions that the state previously requested? No, you are. Uh, all right. Um, and is she, she can be evaluated for that program. And I should say this, the court has made no decisions here, but the court is taking into consideration all of the requests. Um, she can be evaluated for that program while she's incarcerated. She can. In fact, uh, I spoke to, uh, I believe her name is uh, Ms. Loader from Cynthia Day. I asked her specifically uh, what, what if she was released on bail uh, uh, and then enter the program. Uh, Ms. Lauder indicated that's not the best uh, situation for Cynthia David. Um, the way they operate, they would, it's better for them if the individual is transported directly from the jail to their program. And the, and the fear judges, if someone is released on bail, there's a possibility of uh, some sort of relapse, and then they don't get the benefit of the program. There's reason to believe that substance abuse is an issue that would qualify her for the program? Yes, Your Honor. Um, all right, is there anything anyone would like to add? No. Right. Um, the court will take this under advisement uh, and issue an order. Uh, 
probably later today. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone. There she goes. So the judge ended up going through with this, approving this. This is everything we listen through in the video, the court uh, hearing. So we don't need to like go through every single thing. Limited criminal history, the court orders, conditions of deferred sentence. Additionally, the defense knows she was aware of police investigation for approximately 10 days. All this stuff was covered in there. Therefore, bail will remain set at 5,000 cash or surety. However, it shall convert to a personal recognizance upon entry and successful completion of the Cynthia Day program. So she's going to go into this program and she has to call in and check in daily with Manchester police. She's required to sign a waiver of extradition before her release and have no contact with Adam Montgomery. She may not travel outside of the state of New Hampshire. These conditions, as well as additional standard conditions, are set forth by the Superior Court bail order issued on today's date. January 24th. I don't see the need to read it over because I read it and it's like everything and it just feels kind of redundant. But yeah, they stated she's indigent and she's going to get into the program. She's going to have to check in. There's all these conditions. And me, it's like things could change with the investigation going ongoing. Things could come out. Evidence could come out. Things could come out and say maybe she knew more than she did. You guys comment down below and let me know your thoughts. If you think that she knew more than she's letting on to be, it's possible maybe she didn't know. Maybe he made up something, some concoction, but she's still in the wrong for collecting these funds. I feel like maybe she knew something. I feel like it's very possible. Let me know down below. I appreciate you guys. Love you. Take care. Peace. Adios.